Infinite Fusion is the gift that keeps on giving. With Monotype and Mono Pokemon runs becoming more and more prevalent, I wanted to do something that I haven't seen yet. What would happen if we did a hardcore Nuzlocke where we're only allowed to fuse Pokemon with themselves? And for the sake of new content, I'll be doing this challenge in Infinite Fusion's post-game, the Johto region. Before jumping in, let me know in the comments what Pokemon you think would have the best double fusion. Also, be sure to subscribe and let's try to smash 1,365 likes. You'll see why later. With all that said, let's get into it. We pick up right where our last journey left off as our mom congratulates us for becoming the Kanto Champion. She lets us know that Oak wants to speak with us about a legendary Pokemon, so we head off to the lab to see what's up. He tells us that his colleague in the Johto region, Professor Elm, wants to give us a Pokemon and has information about a man-made Pokemon that once fled Cinnabar Mansion. As we step off the train in Goldenrod City, Whitney tells us that her gym is having its grand reopening and we're welcome to challenge her. Before any gym battles, I want to see Elm so I continue on, but oddly enough get no encounters before reaching Azalea Town where Slowpoke Well is flooding the area. Turns out Yusin was the cause of this, but before we can catch him, he runs off. After telling Kurt, who at this time is still the town's gym leader, he gives us the TM for dive so we can help out the shelter that were jammed into the well. We complete a strength puzzle that consists of pushing Slowpoke into the shelter so they evolve into Slowbro, and then the water starts flowing normally again. This also apparently has brought back my encounters, so our first new team member is Hitmonlee. After catching two and fusing them together, we get this homage to Bruce Lee in his iconic yellow and black jumpsuit. Get your popcorn ready because we have a whole slew of encounters and fusions coming up. Our Union Cave encounter is Zatu giving us this psychic flying fusion. In Ilex Forest, I surfed to get two Ponyta, on Route 34 I caught a pair of Kadabra, and on Route 35 I catch some Drifloon. While Kadabra and Ponyta don't have custom sprites quite yet, Drifloon sure does as we now have a bunch of balloons join the squad. They then evolve into a big Drifloon before reaching its final form, Giant Blimp. Then after beating a trainer with a Mag Duck, Ponyta evolves into Pony Dash, who I think should be a real Stage 1 mod. Our Kadabra fusion also evolves into Mega Alakazam, and we get to see the final form of Rapidash. Now at the ruins of Alf, I grab a Rattata, and unfortunately am handed my first death as I switch Hitmonlee into a Slappert with Play Rough. At least we have our new Rat King to replace the martial artist. Now on Route 32, I catch one of my favorites, Sandile. I'm pretty disappointed by Rattata's evolution though, as it's just a reskinned Raticate, but when we get the full Raticate fusion, the king returns to his rightful spot on the throne. In Violet City's Sprout Tower, I navigate my way to the top without being spotted by Monks or the Bellsprout line in order to get my hands on a new key item, the Golbat Boots. Continuing on to Route 31, we have an incredible encounter as we run into an Ivasaur. The fusion looks like it would be a pre-evolved form of clone Venusaur from Mewtwo Strikes Back. Route 30 is another fan favorite, Hone Edge, whose base form fusion is actually just a Dublade with a blue color scheme. Finally on Route 29 before New Bark Town, we grab ourselves a Clang. Now that we're in Elm's lab, the professor has the audacity to say he can't trust us until we show him at least two Johto badges. Since I can't get duplicates of any of the starters, I surf on Route 27 and catch Shuckle, then go to Tojo Falls where we're blessed with an Axew. Look at this double Shuckle fusion. This thing is an absolute menace. Double Clang is also pretty cool. It's a good in-between mon before Kling Clang. And on Route 46, we grab another Steel-type, Matang, which fuses into... just a regular Metagross. I also found a fun little Easter egg in Violet City. If you go to this house in the southwest, you find Giovanni and his son Silver. Before taking on Whitney for our first Johto badge, we need to evolve these fusions. First is Ivasaur becoming a young Venusaur before evolving once more into this behemoth. Then there's Matang, whose single Metagross form is actually insanely cool, but then it just turns into plain old Mega Metagross. Our Sandile fusion only has a custom sprite as Double Crocodile, but boy was this worth the wait. My favorite fusion on the team so far. Next is Clanang evolving into Clan Clang, and finally an abomination of gears. Our Axie worked its way through non-custom sprites until we finally see Double Haxorus. What a unit. 
Lastly, I buy two Dusk Stones for Doublet, evolving him into Doe Slash and then Double Age of Slash, which is just a really big sword. Now it's time for our first gym battle. Since I continued a randomized file, Whitney's Pokemon were fully random, but after this gym I fixed it so leaders at least had their appropriate typing. With that said, she opens with a Man U as I lead Metagross. The pure water type Cosmic Powers as we hit a hammer arm for just under 50% of its health. Our next misses as the Speedy Fish uses Bounce, actually paralyzing our robot as it lands on us, but we break through for a Meteor Mash on the same turn. After Whitney uses a few full restores, we eventually drop her lead with a Meteor Mash, and she sends in Weegeus. Not wanting to be hit by a Dark or Ghost-type move, I swapped a Crocodile who eats Dark Pulse. After another, our foul play doesn't do much damage, and then we flinch on the next. This time we go for Earthquake, almost getting the KO, but instead of risking a crit, I switch out to Clink Clang. After Dark Pulse and Night Slash, we're at about half our health, but a Mirror Shot is able to finish the Magical Claw Pokemon. Third is a Gabite Galvantula fusion, so fearing a ground type move, I go to Venusaur, who's now a pure grass type. We're hit by Dig for minimal damage, but I lock myself into Petal Dance, not realizing this is a dragon type and not ground. We tank some not very effective hits and just aren't able to take the Arachnid down before succumbing to confusion. I decide to go for a double edge as we break through our Delirium, along with Paralysis, in order to take Mon number 3 down, but my team isn't looking so hot. Nocturtle is next up as I bring Aegislash into a Moonblast, so that worked out well. I make a bad call Iron Heading the Clearwater type and pay for it via Hydro Pump bringing us down to 42 HP. Haxorus however tanks the move nicely, but after Dragon Claw can't finish the Watery Owl, it Moonblasts our Double Dragon into the red. I stay in knowing I'll outspeed and D-Claw again for a kill, bringing out her Ace, which is coincidentally a Miltank fusion. I opt to go back to Metagross now, who takes low damage from Wake Up Slap. Next turn, we're able to shrug off one more, and thankfully a single hammer arm is all it takes to decimate the normal Steel type, somehow netting us a Deathless first badge. Without anything else to do, we beeline to Azalea to challenge Kurt and his bug types. His lead is Belia as I send in Rapidash. Flame Charge brings the Deadly Rose into the red as we start boosting our speed. Thanks to a held metronome, after Kurt burns two full restores, our charge is strong enough to one-shot. Next up is Hurricane, so I go for Fire Blast, which only does around 70% to this monster, but we survive punishment in the red. I go back to Flame Charge now, but it doesn't get the kill, so it's time to say goodbye to our giant steed as a hammer arm sends him to the death box. Zatu cleans the ace up with Air Slash, and third to hit the field is Yan Lojin, which is my sleep paralysis demon. It outspeeds and crits an Air Slash, but thanks to Stab and a Sky Plate, ours is strong enough to Oko. Now we're met with Nidother, who also Air Slashes, bringing us into the red as our Psychic does the same to the Poison type. Great minds think alike as we both swap here to Steel types, but look at how sick Clinkther is. This thing has Plasma Chainsaws. Too bad for him I have Hammer Arm, as even with a Shift Gear and an Air Slash flinch, we're barely hurt before taking the Robo Bug down. Now it just takes a bullet punch to finish Nidother, and that's badge 2 in our hands. But that's not enough. I need to show Elm that he was wrong to disrespect us, so before even talking to him again, we're gonna get badge 3 from Faulkner. First up is Ratgeot, which feels like a fitting team member for the bird user. After a Tailwind, the first full restore gets used, but then a pair of discharges take the flying rat out with an Endeavor coming out between hits. Dotris is next up who Magnet Rises before also being healed. After a low roll discharge, Faulkner surprisingly switches to Aegeot who survives two of our shocks and Mirror moves the second, paralyzing us in the process. Now it's a double swap as B-Mega comes out to take on Monster Shuckle. A missed screech and a power split bode terribly for the B who U-turns out, sacrificing his friend Aegeot to our first Stone Edge. Now the bug comes back to face the music as a second screech is dodged and it's decimated by our stones. Dotris comes back next and actually connects the 50% accurate zap cannon, guaranteeing paralysis. Thanks to Fortress's high defense, our stone edge is shrugged off, so I go to Metagross who avoids the cannon shot. One hammer arm is able to drop the sheltered roadrunner, leaving only Faulkner's ace, Garabat. Hurricane can't do much to us, and despite getting confused, we land three Zen headbutts in a row to finish this battle and earn the Zephyr Badge. 
After rubbing my badges in this nerd's face, he profusely apologizes and then tells us that Mewtwo is in Cerulean Cave, which everybody already knows. He then gives us Waterfall, which is needed to get to the Legendary, but I'm not too concerned with that right now. In order to progress further, I make my way through Dark Cave and arrive at Blackthorn City. I have to take a second to show off this gym trainer's duoris. This thing is crazy. Anyway, after doing the gym puzzle wrong, I softlock myself, so now I need to battle Claire a bit underleveled and with one illegal Pokemon on my team I was using for HMs. Wish me luck. She leads Rapiorus against my Haxorus. Luckily, she gets greedy in Swords Dances as we one-shot with Dragon Claw. Against Dragavy, I set up a dance of my own, and after surviving Dragon Rush, I click Dragon Claw and pray. The Dragonite Eevee Fusion and Claire's next mon, Rose Tina, fall to our slashes, but of course she has a Fairy Dragon as her ace. I switch to Metagross, who tanks a pair of Dragon Pulses and is able to meteorically mash the Seahorse back into its Pokeball, leaving the leader with only an Aglis. Hammer Arm does around 75% to the Steel Dragon, and after a heal, our Speed Drop helps, making Metal Burst fail twice and allowing us to pick up another Gym Badge with relative ease. Continuing on to a new area above Blackthorn called the Ice Mountains, I catch some Seedra. This is also where the Golbat boots we got in Sprout Tower need to be used, allowing us to jump over small gaps. You may have noticed the level cap went down. That's because I didn't realize I wasn't supposed to battle Claire fourth. I'll get new encounters to take on the next two leaders, so all will be well. The mountains led out on Route 44, where our encounter is Machoke, who fused together into whatever this is. Passing through Mahogany Town on our way to the Lake of Rage on Route 43, we run into a trainer with this amazing Porygon Cofagrigus fusion. It's an OG Game Boy. And my encounter on the route ends up being a Totodile. Plus, after catching the starter, we see Double Kingdra's form, which is simple but nice. At the lake, I nab a Vibrava and am really excited to use Flygon on the team. We all remember what happened last time I said that. Such a troll move by the creators to replace Shiny Gyarados with a Magikarp Gyarados fusion. This one really got me. While doing some grinding, Machoke evolves, and I really like the Machoke Machamp sprite. In Mount Mortar, we catch Prinplup, whose double fusion is so fancy. I wish this was the real Prinplup. Now on Route 37, we catch Politoed and get this big lovable guy. We also get our first Totodile and Vibrava custom sprites here with Totoligator and Vibragon. Plus, we get Double Machamp, who's an absolute unit. I mean Greek god status. Finally, at a Crutique City, we puzzle our way through the Burn Tower to convince Morty to head back to the gym so we can challenge him. But not just yet. First, we need to make our way back to the Sevi Islands, where Chuck is undergoing some good old-fashioned waterfall training. Before taking him on, I grind the team so that Vibragon becomes Double Flygon, we get a Double Feraligator who actually looks like it could be a Paradox form, and Double Empoleon. Now it's time for another badge. Chuck leads a Cofalume as I send out Zatu. We start strong with an Air Slash flinch, and then the fighting leader swaps into Type Cross, who takes over 50% from the same. After a 4 times resisted reversal, we take the Burning Bug down and Luxlade hits the field. So cool. This time our Aerial Strike does less than half, and then a Discharge leaves us with a measly 2 HP. I switch over to Psychic, which does much better damage, and with two full restores gone, we get another knockout under our feathers. Ursali is next, and to my surprise, we're outsped, so close combat spells the end for our bird. I go to Drifblim since he's immune to fighting, but I also realize my Ghost-type moves won't hit the dual normal type. I go for Payback as Cofalume comes back in, and it manages to survive the Dark-type move. Luckily, we outspeed next turn for an ominous Wind KO, but I don't get the boost. Now with Ursali back in, and my genius decision to replace Payback with Phantom Force, we're at a stalemate. I decide to go to Venusaur, and sadly, a crit Mega Kick cracks him between the eyes for another death. Hollytoad is my next gambit as I Perish Song the Fighting Bear and survive Mega Kick. Now I bring Drifblim back in who can't be hit and wait to complete the Perish Trap. But of course, Chuck swaps to another normal fighting type, Maros, so my plan just fell through. Knowing Scary Face will be used, I go to Flygon, but Thrash next turn hits harder than expected as our Dragon Claw only does around 40%. 
To try to preserve this dragon, I bring in another who sadly can't finish the muscle-bound bull with Waterfall and gets taken out by Thrashes. This allows Flygon to come back and declaw the freak of nature, leaving Chuck with only that damn Ursaly. I bring Driplin back and notice that the Mon is locked into close combat by its choice band, which no longer has PP. This means I can bring Politoed in and just spam Surf until I finally get the kill, earning us a hard-fought badge 5. With the cap only moving one level before price, I couldn't keep everyone at 65, but I led with a level 65 Mon, so we could say the experience from the first kill would have pushed the rest to 66 anyway. The Ice Lead is an insane Mawile Cloister fusion, but its 4 times weakness to fighting means we just need to live through an Icicle Crash before getting the first KO with Cross Chop. Next is this Pillar Swine Raikou, and I was not expecting extra sensory. We somehow survived the attack, so Cross Chop number 2 means Knockout number 2. Another Cloister fusion, Herister, is third, whose reversal does virtually nothing to Shuckle. After an Icicle Crash, I Shell Smash, but we're outsped and Mega Horned next turn, surprisingly killing our tank. Kling Clang is next for us, who misses his first Screech, but connects on the second after some reversals. As I decide to go for Shift Gear, the Beetle reveals close combat, so there go our gears. Machamp should be able to drop this thing after the defense drop, but I forgot how slow he is, so now this thing is threatening a sweep. For Alligator is my best bet now, who tanks Icicle Crash pretty well and almost one shots with Aqua Tail. I slash on the heel and then finally finish the job with another Aqua Tail, but Price still has two more Mons. We trade not very effective attacks with the Dragon Eye Shell Vial, and next turn it's Dark Pulse and Ice Beam, plus a Roat Berry doing decent damage to us. I go to my other Steel type and Polion, who of course has no Steel moves. In a war of attrition, our Ice Beams beat out the Armored Weasel's Dark Pulses, and we see the Ice Leader's last team member, Artichamp. Dynamic Punch sadly does us in, but Politoed is my glimmer of hope here. As I bring him in, the legendary Brawler uses Hail, so we get our Perish Song set up. Turn 1 of the trap where Dynamic punched and confused. Then Politoed is taken down, meaning Feraligator either needs to kill this thing now, or survive one last attack. By pure luck, we dodge Dynamic Punch and Aqua Tail doesn't get the kill, meaning we actually needed the safety net of Perish Song. Shaking from the adrenaline of snatching victory from the jaws of defeat, I had no time to rest. Back to the Sevi Islands for a few more encounters before the next gym. First, I catch two Magnemite on Bond Bridge, fusing them into two Magnemites stuck together. Next is Berry Forest, where we grab ourselves a Luxio. My Kin Island encounter is a Dino, and I'm really excited to see Double Hydreigon. Can we talk about how hard this Cofagrigus Mawile fusion goes, though? Also, Magnemite's evolutions are actually priceless. Magneton and Magnemite is just four of them stuck together, and I think you can guess what two Magnetons look like. Plus, we get Double Lux right here, who's got a cool prehistoric Sabertooth kind of vibe. You've heard of Farfetch'd plus Sword. Now introducing Farfetch'd Sword. Back in Berry Forest, we help this guy find his kid and friends, and he gives us a Marini doll as thanks. We can use this to clear out Corsola that block our path into Sevi Islands, namely opening up the Water Labyrinth, which is exactly what it sounds like. Once we make it through this hellish puzzle, we arrive at Chrono Island, where I get another teammate, Grovile. Is this fusion a reference to something, or did the devs just want a South American-inspired gecko? I also find Jasmine here who tells me she'll accept my challenge at the island's battlefield, but first grinding for Morty. Underwater I catch Dugong and this fusion makes me uncomfortable. Also Double Sceptile is just as odd to me as Grovile. Below the power plant we pick up a Magnet Stone which is needed to evolve Magneton into Magnezone. I actually really like the Magneton Magnezone fusion, and the final is, as expected, two Magnezone stuck together. Finally, at level 65, we get to see Double Hydreigon, and he does not disappoint. So much more intimidating than the base form. Now it's time to circle back to a Crew to take on Morty. His lead is Coughapert, and I think I'm obsessed with Coughagrigus fusions. Hydreigon's Hustle Boosted Crunch is able to drop the mummy, but as the fighting type Dewtop hits the field, I swap to Sceptile, who barely hangs on through close combat. Knowing all out speed, I go for Leaf Blade, and with minus one defense, we topple the top. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, that's easy for Magnazone. 
Shandalix is pretty cool, and fearing a ground type move, I go to Crocodile, who's unaffected by Sandstorm. After an earthquake, we're tickled by Stone Edge, but on the heal, I use Crunch and proc Flame Body. Now I fire off an abysmal foul play and fish for a crit crunch, which comes as Morty switches into a Zuminor. Predicting a play rough, I go to Magnazone, who dodges Hydro Pump, but still a good pivot. A pair of discharges pick up the knockout as the watery ghost sets up Future Sight. Now it's back to the Lamp Snake, who's paralyzed by our electricity, but manages to break through to get underground. I bring Raticking in, expecting a sack, but we get the full para. Throat Chop just isn't enough to wrap things up, so we are forced to take a dig, but it really doesn't do much damage, so one more chop to this thing's non-existent throat earns us Johto Badge 7. Well, Jasmine, do your worst. Her knight in shining armor hangs on through Flygon's Earthquake, but thanks to a metronome, we get stronger with each use. After burning a few heals, the leader swaps to Jiracot, which is immediately taken out by our dragon. Her ace Octario, Steewag, and Emperor go down to the same, but her final mon is Jumplix, who could be flying type. Deciding not to risk Flygon, I go to Magnazone as the Serpent reveals Bounce. We tank the hit, but then see the discharge is not very effective, so I could have already had this battle won. After a long war of attrition, we eventually come out on top by way of Sceptile's X Scissors, and that's all the gym badges this game has to offer. But don't think that's the end of the story. Back in Oak's lab, we see Cynthia? She tells us that at the peak of Mount Silver, there's something distorting the laws of physics. It seems that both time and space are being manipulated, which is why Cynthia has come, to see if it's the doing of Dialga and Palkia. At the base of the mountain, we get one last encounter, Slowking, whose fusion is a cool little twist on its Galarian form. On our way to the peak, we're intercepted by our rival who wants to battle. He leads an Infernape Genesect fusion with Download, and with Tukadile out for us, I'm terrified of a close combat, so I go to Paradox Gator as we see a Combine. By the way, I nicknamed my mons for the endgame. Thankfully, we dodge what would have been a plus one Zap Cannon, and Waterfall is strong enough to one-shot. Krook Ring is next, who actually survives Waterfall, but we get the flinch, so a Surf finishes the ace off. Pororon is super cool, but all it does is Magic Coat, so two Surfs knock it out easily. This brings out Sijask, so I go to Magnazones, who barely feels an Iron Head. After a second, it just takes a single discharge for Squirt to reveal his legendary fusion, Armos. Sadly for him, it's a Rock type, so a pair of Flash Cannons allow us to continue on unscathed. Just before the summit, Cynthia comes crying to us that we need to turn back and the monster at the top is too powerful, so it's time to teach her a lesson. She leads a Lantern Raikou fusion who rain dances as Tukadile splits the ground beneath its feet. Now she sends out a double Charizard fusion and wow, that's awesome. I bring Paradox Gator into a fire spin and thanks to the rain the Sinnoh champ set up, we dispose of her armored dragon with a single waterfall. With Hipger next, I need to make a switch, so I go to Alduin, who's unaffected by Psyshock. After trading misses, our Hydra locks in and destroys Cynthia's second legendary fusion with Crunch. Now we're faced down by Stun Ape, so it's back to the Gator taking basically no damage from Flail. After, Surf plus Sticky Barb damage leave it in the red, so the next Flail could be scary. I go to Buster, who wouldn't be hit by it, but the rivaling champ also switches to her ace, Hounsius. I can't keep our sword in here, so I decide to go back to Hydreigon and start sweating as I see Nasty Plot. We're hit and burned by the 50% accurate Inferno, but at least it's not very effective. Our Dragon Rush doesn't do much, and I take a big risk here with Hustle as another Inferno hits, but you turn out before burn damage potentially kills us. As Recover is used, Feraligator fires off a 4 times effective superpower to obliterate the Arceus fusion. Now it's just down to Stun Ape, and I really had no reason to be scared of Flail. At the peak of Mount Silver, our body feels heavy as we drudge on toward the Pokemon causing the disturbance. As we get close, we're transported three years into the future, and every Pokemon fan is familiar with this scene. This time we'll be looking at it from Red's perspective instead of Gold's, so let's take on the legendary post-game battle. The Johto protagonist leads Golwack, and I decide to swap Buster to Tukadile, whose Intimidate helps her eat Bone Rush. An Earthquake almost drops the Poison Ground type, but it hangs on and hits a fairly meaty double edge. On the heal, we high roll for the knockout, but now Gold sends in his ace, Whaligator. 
I switch to Magnazones, but a crit Hydro Pump leaves us in the red. I don't want to risk another swap, so sadly I let our Magnetic Buddy go down to Superpower. With the defense drop, I bring in Not a Pseudo and Dragon Claw for about 75%, but a Citrus Berry brings the water type back above half health. Its Hydro Pump does about the same to us, but with a full restore use, we spam D Claw for the kill. Now the legendary fusions start as Lead Quaza hits the field. I bring Paradox Gator into a Dragon Pulse, which he takes well, and after a Hyper Voice, our Ice Fang does around a third of the Flying Bug's health. Rocky Helmet puts us in a dangerous range, so I go to Buster, who I know can eat whatever will be thrown our way. Now I Iron Head for about the same as Ice Fang, but totally get outplayed as Gold heals and D-Dances as I try to King Shield. I decide Buster needs to stay in and try to slay this dragon, but it ekes her out on its last legs. Our Gator is able to survive Hyper Voice as he comes in, but sadly I use the physical Ice Fang and die to Rocky Helmet damage. Not knowing what could be next, I go to my fully healthy Hydreigon, but we see Clinkatar in all its bionic glory. I U-turn to Tukadile, who gets an Intimidate off and is locked onto. Thankfully, we outspeed, so the Steel Rock type is destroyed by Earthquake. With the Grass Fire, McGrowth in, I feel safe going to a Dragon, Alduin. She tanks two Power Whips and connects three roughly 60% accurate Dragon Rushes in a row to drop the Burning Bush along with Artijask, cementing our place as the number one champion. With that, we're sent back to our own time where our mom tells us we've been gone for days. She gives us the shiny charm that Cynthia left behind, making shiny odds now 1 in 1,365, so maybe there'll be a shiny only run coming up. For now, we have some unfinished business as mom also tells us that the Pokemon who transported us is still on top of Mount Silver. This time, we're able to encounter the monster and to our surprise, it's a triple fusion, Paldiatina. I lead off with Duogong and try to get a speed drop with Icy Wind, but two Aura Spheres destroys our Icy Boys. Next I go to Gektile and dual chop the Palkia portion of the fusion for just under half its health, but an Aqua Tail followed by Shadow Force do our second team member in. Now Alduin hits the field, but in her most crucial moment she misses Dragon Rush, yet manages to survive a super effective Aura Sphere thanks to a resisted Hydro Pump and Hex. With 16 HP, she's able to finish Palkia off at the cost of her own life via Aura Sphere. Now it's time for Nada Sudo and her monstrous 300 attack stat to show us what she can do. A single Dragon Claw shreds Giratina right back to the Distortion World, and after dodging an Iron Tail, she does over half to Dialga before Roar of Time rips her apart. With the heavy lifting over, it's time to let Flygons be Flygons as an Earthquake finishes the Steel Dragon, ridding this world of being swallowed to a distorted rift of time and space. With that, only a Vortex is left behind that leads to a rematch with Gold. And there you have the post-game of Pokemon Infinite Fusion. Some of these double fusions were so cool and I hope you guys had as much fun seeing them in action as I did. I wonder if we'll ever see all the amazing sprites this game has to offer. But for now, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to smash that like button and subscribe so you don't miss out on the next one. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.